acres of corn that averaged 20 odd bushels per acre for a total of some 2 billion bushels. Now we grow about 84 million acres of corn with an average yield of 37 bushels to the acre for a total nationally of about 3 billion at 200 million bushels. Then we planted soybeans on the acres that we were able to liberate from corn. And so we can feed our livestock a very much better balanced ration. The number of pounds of milk or the pounds of butter fat per cow roughly doubled during the 20 year period due to the use of soybean enriched diet. And so between the killing off of the horses and the substituting of tractors and the use of hybrid corn and the development of a big acreage of soybeans, we were able to feed the additional 28 million people during the 20 year period without any substantial effort. But now we have come to a situation where all of those things are largely used up. For instance, we don't gain anything by killing off the other 5 million horses because they aren't being fed heavily anyhow. We have no more acres of corn that we can transfer from open pollinated to hybrid. And we can't stand any more acres from the corn land to put into soybeans. So we have gone about as far in that direction as we can go. You have a very flattening line in our ability to increase production. At the same time, we are currently gaining in population at the rate of over two and a half million people a year. Now, instead of taking 20 years to learn how to feed 28 million extra people, we are going to have to learn how to feed something like 26 million more people in the next 10 years. When you get a widening gap between our natural desire to increase population and our ability to increase food production, that widening gap will interpret itself into higher agricultural prices. Our food situation is rather terrifying unless you happen to know enough about agriculture to know that there are ways to jack up our production, just like we have jacked it up in the past. We have not exhausted our jacks by any means. I suspect actually that the two most important jacks that will be used in the future are the widespread use of cellulose, such as corn cobs for the fattening of cattle and sheep, and the very greatly increased use of fertilizer. There isn't any doubt at all that the increase of crops in Iowa can be very great if we can get more synthetically fixed nitrogen available. And the manufacturers of nitrogen are now expanding their facilities so that more nitrogen is going to be available. Now the thing that's going to bring cellulose and fertilizer into use is this widening gap between our natural desire to increase population and our ability to increase food production. What's going to happen is now happening and that is, you get a shortage of food. When cattle are above $30 a hundred in price, you can be mighty sure that it's because there is not as much beefsteak as people would like. And it's this demand that brings price up, and it's the price that brings supply up. It's the American way of doing it. It's always been that way, and always will be done that way, we hope. Scarcities bring high prices, and high prices stimulate production. Because the population is growing with such extreme rapidity, it's a fair assumption that agricultural prices are going to stay high in relationship to other prices in the foreseeable future. You can put in the international situation and our commitments to other countries if you wish. I have never thought it worthwhile putting in those because they can change. But the population of the United States has always more than doubled in any one 50-year period in history. Some of the brightest economists in the government think it's going to double in the next 50 years. I won't be here to see it, so I don't know. But certainly the present trend shows that we're going to learn, have to learn how to feed more than 200 million people, 50 million more than we have now in the next 25 years. I see nothing on the horizon for Iowa except the prosperity that comes from an increasing market, increasing each year and year after year. I think Iowa is facing its most prosperous future that it ever has had, and I think that applies to the other Corn Belt states to a lesser degree. Iowa, of course, is the leading state agriculturally. 
And so it's going to benefit the most by that prosperity. I think we're going to have to learn how to farm better. And I think we will learn this under the pressure of high prices. And I think people will fertilize corn at a dollar seventy-five cents a bushel, who would not fertilize it at a dollar. I think people are going to learn to feed corn cobs and corn stocks when corn is a dollar seventy-five cents a bushel, when they wouldn't feed it with corn at fifty cents a bushel. I think people are going to irrigate. I think people are going to contour. I think people are going to use better machinery. I think they are going to demand better implements. I think they are going to do all of the things that any active industry would do when it's in a prosperous era and when it's trying to satisfy an expanding market at substantial profits. Frankly, I think it's papers like the Des Moines Register who have a very alert farm department who are going to contribute most. The Farm and Home Register has been extremely alert in carrying stories of the new developments. They have been alert in searching out people who did the best job of fertilizing. They have been alert in searching out the new and progressive stories in agriculture. And actually, the farm editor and the farm department have contributed very greatly to the prosperity of Iowa and will continue to do so. And in addition, intelligent advertising from good people who are supplying the necessary things for the work that faces us is most helpful. I think that this whole general project of educating Iowa so that Iowa can produce more and more food is not only a necessary thing, I think it is extremely profitable to those who participate in the education. And I think the whole picture needs to be drawn clear, not only for the farmers themselves, but for the advertisers who advertise. I think those people can be of real service by advertising and encouraging the sale of products that contribute to the increased production of food. Even those who don't sell strictly farm items may see fit to advertise in order to get their share of the increased buying power that will come to agricultural Iowa. In short, my firm and solid confidence in the future is attributable to the fact that the United States has now matured to a point where we are going to need most of our food for our own domestic consumption. I suspect that there is enough alertness in Iowa and the other states so that we can continue to eat as well as we are now for another 25 years, and that's about as long as I have personally to worry about. So I haven't tried to look much beyond that. But I don't think that we are going to be able to increase food enough to break prices. I don't think we are going to increase food without the stimulus of high price. I just think we have work to do. And I think it's going to be fun to do it. You're right, Mr. Garce. The future looks bright for Iowa farmers. And the Iowa Farm and Home Register is the way to reach and sell the rich Iowa farm market. It reaches over 250,000 Iowa farm and rural families, more than any other farm publication. It brings modern publication techniques to the Iowa farm field. Excellent pictures invite interest and visualize story copy. 14 photographers use the latest techniques to bring more pictures, diagram pictures, and how to do it stories to readers. A staff plane and pilot photographer speed air views to publication offices. Air photography is on Excel for explaining new soil conservation methods. Short timely articles plus plenty of pictures save time for busy farmers and make for clarity and impact. The editorial staff is made up of men who were raised on farms, who understand farm problems. These men get out into the field, talk with farmers, and speak their language. This background, combined with years of journalistic experience, qualifies the Farm and Home Register to speak for Iowa farmers. The Advertising Research Foundation recently completed an audience study of the Iowa Farm and Home Register. This is the first foundation farm paper study based on total population and reveals that the Iowa Farm and Home Register has an audience of 810,000 Iowa readers over 15 years of age. 
It shows the audience distribution between urban, rural, and farm areas. It shows audience characteristics by sex, age, economic, and educational levels, as well as household and farm equipment possessions. This study gives ample proof of the broad and intensive readership of the Iowa Farm and Home Register. It has been published and is available for study. The Farm and Home Register is the only Iowa magazine that gets to the farmer's door on Sunday morning. It is delivered by over 1,200 adult motor route men who travel more than 50,000 miles, twice around the world each delivery day. Each paper is carefully placed under a metal clip. The farmer doesn't even have to walk to the RFD box to get his copy. This miracle of delivery is achieved with fast trucks that highball across the state to distribution centers where motor route men load their cars for local farm delivery. Sunday is the day the farmer and his family have the most leisure time to read. This means more interested readers per advertising dollar. Every issue of the Farm and Home Register reaches 72% of all Iowa farm families, 146,000 of them plus 104,000 rural families living in towns of 2,500 or smaller for a total farm and rural circulation of 250,000. This is more than any other farm publication. But that's not all. The Farm and Home Register also reaches 67,000 farm owners living in Iowa cities and towns. And in addition, intensive dealer coverage reaches 75% of all Iowa distributors and salesmen, a tremendous influence in establishing and holding a distributing organization, an automatic merchandiser for an advertising campaign. The rich Iowa farm market gets complete coverage with the Iowa Farm and Home Register, a three-way coverage of farm families, farm owners, and farm dealers. This triple package has one low rate, the lowest rate for the most coverage in the Iowa farm market. The Iowa Farm and Home Register reaches more Iowa families than any other newspaper or farm magazine, national, regional, or state. It is used successfully by the nation's leading farm advertisers. It is the advertising highway to the farm wealth of Iowa. symbol of a spirit that links the Americas in a common bond of union and solidarity. The exact ancestry of corn is a matter of doubt. Corn as we know it today could not have existed in the wild. Many scientists believe that it developed from teosinte, which has a tassel like corn, but unlike corn, the ears grow in clusters and are composed of a few kernels arranged end to end instead of growing on a cob. Others believe the ancestor of corn was a plant resembling modern gamma grass. This plant had several tassels which contained both male pollen and female seeds. The lower part of the tassel contained the female seeds, shown in red, and the upper part contained the male pollen, shown in yellow. In the course of evolution, the tassels at the top produced only male pollen. The tassels on the branches, only female seeds. These branches shortened, and their tassels were enclosed by husks. Later, the tassel developed into a crude ear. This early ancestor of corn grew on the sunny slopes of the high Cordilleras many centuries ago. Its glistening pods went unnoticed by the roving hunter, for he was intent only on his search for game. The Indian lived on 
on what he could kill. To eat and sleep was all that he asked. As long as game was plentiful, he lived well. But there were times when game grew scarce. The search for food drove him far and wide. Wearied and hungry, he resorted to eating roots. But that was not enough. It was then that the waving tassels of grain drew his eye. He had now found a practical solution to his food problem. And so, through his discovery of corn, the civilization of the Americas began. With a crude clamshell hole, he dug the earth, planted his very best kernels, an offering to the corn gods was made to ensure an abundant crop. At every harvest, he selected his finest ears for seed and blessed them in the sacred waters of salt, which he believed improved its growth. Because corn was so vital to his existence, he erected great temples to the corn god. The civilization of the Mayas was built around the growth and worship of corn. Yumkash was the green god, patron of growing corn. An amazing calendar was developed by the Maya to chart his planting and harvesting. To the gods who held the four corners of the earth, this symbol for planting was dedicated. The Maya planted four grains to the hill, and today many farmers still plant four seeds to the hill. One for the blackbird, one for the crow, one for the cutworm, and one to grow. A few centuries later, the Aztecs rose to power. Their great civilization, too, was built on corn. Sintiotl was their corn goddess. Patlique was Mother Earth. Human lives were sacrificed to her that their blood might increase her fertility. In the Andes existed one of the greatest civilizations of the ages, the Incas. They farmed in terraces far up the steep mountainside. They worshipped the sun god on whose bounty they depended for their precious corn. They developed corn with giant kernels, three times regular size. Corn migrated into the Argentine, Brazil, across the Rio Grande, far north into Canada. Corn was carried to Europe by the conquistadores, to North Africa by the Barbary pirates. Corn is grown along the Danube, the Nile, in South Africa, India, China, a vital force in the economic life of the world. Corn is our heritage from the Indian. From its golden kernels, we make tortillas, enchiladas, tamales. He gave us corn bread, hominy, succotash, corn mush, forerunners of cornflakes. He taught us the joys of eating popcorn and roasting ears. From the Indian, we learned to ferment corn. The skill and patience of this early ancestor created a new civilization. To him, we owe much. Today, we plow a dozen furrows at a time, plant many acres in a day, pick and husk by machines. We do in 15 hours what the early Maya required 500 to do. Much has been learned about corn, the most important of which is inbreeding. Now to accomplish this, a paper sack is slipped over the tassel. Then transparent bags are placed over the ear shoots before the silks emerge to prevent pollinization from other plants. When the silks are out and the tassel is shedding, Pollen is released into the sack covering the tassel. Now the bag is removed from the ear chute, and the sack containing pollen is slipped over the ear. In this way, the silks are fertilized with pollen from the same plant. This is known as inbreeding. After each generation of inbreeding, the resulting seeds produce smaller corn until a pure strain is reached and sizes remain fixed. This may seem odd to deliberately produce smaller plants, but just wait and we'll see what happens when two unrelated inbred strains are joined in wedlock. My, 
My, my, what a child. Stronger stalks and increased yields, making better seed corn for bigger crops. Of the total production of corn in the United States, 75% goes for feeding livestock. Cattle, sheep, horses, mules, and hogs. More hogs make more little pigs, and more pigs make more little sausages, and vice versa. Corn increases the cream content, builds up little calves. Surplus corn fattens the feeder from the range more economically than any other crop, converting him into choicest beef. And they love it, too. Just watch. has what it takes. And now comes the chemist who has discovered and developed many products from corn. The kernel consists of two main parts, the endosperm and the germ from which oil is extracted, furnishing salad oil for your table, cooking oil for your kitchen. From the endosperm, the chief product obtained is starch, starch used in making ice cream, pudding, Pies like Mother used to make. And starch that stiffens your shirt. Starch makes sizing for textiles. Paste for the bill poster. And mucilage for postage stamps. From starch comes glucose, rich golden syrup for cornbread, griddle cakes, jams, preserves. In surgery, glucose replaces sugars lost from the blood. Starch makes sugar, the sweet tooth of the corn. Quick energy as candy. It's the body and flavor of your soft drink, the boost in your beer. Corn sugar is one of nature's most easily assimilated foods. Doctors prescribe it, babies cry for it. As science scans the glass of the future, it sees new vital uses for corn. Alcohols for power fuels, high explosives, tires from corn. Fabric for parachutes, better than silk. Plastic, tougher than steel. For cars, for tanks, men of war, ships of peace. Farm machines, and streamlined trains, and buildings of the future of plastic. Monuments to corn. It's a far cry from those primitive days when the waving grain attracted the roving hunter. Little did he realize the store of riches they contained. The botanist called it Zaya Maze, that which sustains the Mayas. How much more truly might we say today, that which sustains the world. The first time I ever heard of or saw Coon Rapids was when I came here to visit the place with Roswell when I was at a teacher's convention, I skipped it to come up and look over Coon Rapids. And that was in about 1920. I, we came into Coon Rapids in the back road that was c covered with dust. And there was no curb and gutter. The, the, uh, it looked pretty uh, unkept. I was used to seeing a pretty town like Cedar Falls or something, and I thought it was awful. And I knew that I was never going to live here. And this was before I definitely said yes. There was a kitchen and a living room and a stairway that had stairs about six inches apart and walls that slanted to the ground. It was a kind of old house that uh, was, uh, there were no